Hello and welcome to Returning to Base, a Mech Warrior Living Legends podcast. I am your host, Warlord Kentax, and our topic today is Project Leads from Past to Present. Our guests are Invictus, the current lead developer from the community development team, and the legendary Kamikaze, or Kami for short, without whom Mech Warrior Living Legends never would have happened. I've got a couple questions for both of you. Uh, feel free to choose between you two who to start with, but uh, how did you first get started with Mech Warrior Living Legends? Well, uh, I guess I'll, I'll go first here, just based on chronological order. So uh, for myself, I'm the co-founder of Mech Warrior Living Legends, and I guess you can call me retired lead developer. Uh, since it was actually uh, Krim and I that started MWL, you know, way back in, what, 2006 now or something like that. Um, it's funny because I was even talking with Andrew um, not too long ago about the old uh, Battlefield 2142 uh, setups that we were doing, and it all started way back with, you know, looking at uh, putting on jump jets on the walkers that were on the uh, 2142, uh, 2142 mechs. And we had the bright idea of, you know, starting off the mod in in that. And uh, myself, when I was uh, starting off with that, Krim actually was looking at importing uh, a lot of animations into 2142 and, and relevance to our uh, topic here, actually. I was uh, looking at creating a lot of different weapons and even... Some very basic, you know, loadouts uh, for mechs, um, including like LBXs and lasers into 2142. And eventually, you know, we pulled this over into uh, the CryEngine. And it was actually uh, a prototype that I was working with in uh, CryEngine where they actually had the physicality of changing the mesh of like the barrels and. Um, any of the, the physical 3D models on the tanks to be able to swap them out for their own, uh, what they call modifications. And that was the being able to actually take the uh, model of the LRM-20 and actually slot it onto the, to the uh, tank uh, for Crisis. It was a proof of concept that, hey, we can actually you know, physically change the models um, on what was actually shown for the different weapons. And so that allowed me to actually start putting together a lot of the uh, early tank mechs to plug all those in with uh, different weapons that we created. Um, and then we took some inspiration from some of the early like TROs, like the uh, PPC Catapult. Um, uh, one of my favorites was like uh, what I called the Beat Stick, the 4LBX20 uh, Madcap Mark II. Uh, but, of course, that got nerfed into the ground, uh, from what I heard, boo. <laughs> but it was more so for the fun factor um, and creating a lot of these variants and making sure that they were as balanced as we can be, but also providing uh, each one of the variants to have on their initial setup um, both variety and purpose on the battlefield. So you had you know ones that were either directed at, like, uh, anti tank or anti-infantry or other anti-mechs, mechs versus mechs, you know, so on and so forth. And then that way that really helped uh, the variants uh, as well as, like, you know, all the different mixed arms that you already have on the battlefield. You have, like, you know, uh, obviously the tanks and the aerospace. They, too, have their own roles, like, I guess, sub-roles, you could say, um, such as, uh, like, the VTOLs being able to have, like, their narcs to be able to have uh, LRM boats in the back uh, to be able to have, like, teams of missile boats in the back being able to bombard the enemies and uh, and have, like, a really good team play in relation to that. But, you know, uh, I can go on and on, but I'll let, uh, I'll let Invictus... Uh, Talk talk for, for talk for a bit for his side of things. So Invictus, uh, how did you get started with Mech Warrior Living Legends? Well, probably about the time that Kami was working with 2142, I was probably playing 2142 and messing around with various games. This was probably about mid 2008 um, when I decided to probably replay Mech Warrior Four again. Um, 
MechWarrior 3 was probably my second PC game I ever bought. And so years later when 4 came out, I played the heck out of that. And since I was such a big fan of Battlefield, um, I ended up searching for MechWarrior Online um, on Google. And one of the pages that came up was must have been one of their really old sites that it was a really basic site um, and it had a pitch for it and it kind of explained what they were going for and they pretty much explained it as MechWarrior but in Battlefield Conquest and so since those were like two of my favorite games I decided well I'm just going to keep bookmark this and uh, about six months later I ended up joining the forums and then I think it was the day after Christmas 2009 is when it first released. And I've been basically playing it on and off ever since. All right. Um, let's see what's my next question. Uh, so what uh, drew you to Battletech instead of some other uh, mech intellectual property? I'll let you go ahead. Oh, well, I didn't actually have much experience with Battletech outside of MechWarrior. Um, in fact, I still didn't know anything about it lore-wise until probably I was about a few years into playing MWL and decided to make a planetary league for it, or the closest thing we could get. And so in order to do that, I had to look up a bunch of stuff in the lore, and that's basically what I work off of now. Um, I do prefer Battletech over most mech stuff, just because a lot of mech stuff is either a little too generic, like they're just kind of robots. Um, that's actually one of my complaints about MWO and MechWarrior 5, is <laughs> they all kind of look the same, so they don't have too much personality. And uh, yeah, they might the look, other uh, they might look sleek and high tech, but at the same time, they don't have they aren't as distinct from each other. Yeah, just the uh, and when you go into the background lore of how they're you know designed sometimes hundreds of years apart, completely different parts of the galaxy. It's like they're not all going to look the same. There's no way. So that's kind of silly. Well, I mean, you know, we are talking about uh, an IP that was created back in the '80s when. Even, you know, Star Trek had everybody as humanoid aliens walking around, so, <laughs> I mean. I think they probably just had such distinct looks from the originals just because they got a bunch of random artists and just drew a bunch of random stuff. And most of the old art is actually really, really bad, but at least it's distinct. It's true, and I think they were trying to, you know, figure out what kind of look that they were going for. And then, of course, you know, I don't know if we wanted to bring up the Harmony Gold issue in this podcast, but there's also that with that artist that's shared between Robotech and, and Battletech, the same designs. Yeah, I'm sure that certainly adds another dimension of uh, uniqueness to each, um, each asset, or each uh, mech tank that's in the game. And so, uh, Kami, how about you? Uh, what got you into Battletech as opposed to some other, um, some other IP? Well, I don't think you can really separate that. If you're a fan of MechWarrior, you are a fan of Me uh, Battletech, whether you believe it or not. Um, I mean, I, I played the MechWarrior series, well, before, well, obviously before the tabletop, um, since I was more of a wider uh, appeal. Uh, I actually played uh, MechWarrior 2 back in, you know, the early, like, DOS and Windows 95 days, didn't really get too far into it. Uh, I didn't actually play much MechWarrior 3, actually. Um, but MechWarrior 4 was my bread and butter. Uh, if anybody remembers, you know, MSN Gaming Zone, I was on there a ton. Uh, and even did, like, a lot of uh, fun projects uh, prior to, like, you know, making MWL. I was doing, like, video editing. Um, and we also... Uh, created like a bunch of clans, did some planetary leagues in MW4. Uh, and then eventually, you know, MW4 died off. Uh, but also there was like, um, what introduced me, I think, to the greater aspect of Battletech uh, was Mech Commander, actually. 
um, if if you remember that uh, early game. I think it was around the same time that MechWarrior 4 was out, uh, and I loved it. I lo- it expanded more on what all the uh, different uh, tanks or even the little battle armor that were around. It, of course, you had that in, in the MechWarrior series, but they were so minor in comparison. Anything besides the mechs, you know, felt insignificant. Whereas the mechs were obviously like the gods of the battlefield, and that's kind of where I think like a lot of people are stemming from when they love the Mech Warrior series, is they think the mechs are be all end all, which uh, I didn't think that they should be, right? Um, especially having exposure to a mixed arms game like Battlefield, right? Um, and it was actually uh, uh, Criminal and I when we. I guess you can call it our mission statement for MechWarrior Live and Legends. We wanted to create a MechWarrior or Battletech uh, universe-based mixed arms um, mixed arms game, and we set out to do that uh, uh, ever since you know Battlefield 2142, and of course you know leveraging the Battlefield you know franchise. We thought that would be the best place to start, but of course you know as history showed, you know going forward with CryEngine. It uh, it came together better in uh, an an engine that was more suited toward being modded. Um, so hopefully, I guess that answers your question. I know I kind of jumped around a bit, but well, it I answers. Guess in a, summary is, go ahead. It answers a slightly different question from what I had intended to ask, but that's fine because uh, that's interesting content nonetheless. Uh, I'd meant to ask, uh, like, so why uh, BattleTech? Mech Warrior and not like I don't know Xenoblade or or some other weird thing like maybe Robotech or or Zoids <laughs> or Zoids yeah <laughs> I I mean I guess maybe this is all lost info um, since the old website got taken down but uh, no it was um it was still like a dream uh, of both Krim and I when we were both really into the MechWarrior franchise, either uh, swapping between, you know, playing MechWarrior 4 or Battlefield that, you know, we we loved uh, the MechWarrior and Battletech universe, right? Um, and just kind of at the time when we were playing both games, uh, of course, you know, the Battlefield 2 at the time when MechWarrior 4 was out, uh, we were really looking forward to maybe like MechWarrior 5 if it was ever going to come down the pipe, but, you know, it was seven years since um, MechWarrior 4 kind of died out that uh, we actually decided, hey, you know what? We should just do it ourselves, right? Because uh, we still had like a bunch of friends with us uh, that we that we played with both for MechWarrior days and then also uh, transitioned over to Battlefield just to remain in the teams together. And we decided, hey, you know, like, why don't we just create this kind of game ourselves? And we had no idea what we were doing. (laughs) So, but, like, you know, trial and error, figuring out um, how to use uh, 3D uh, modeling uh, software, um, figuring out how to do any sort of programming within the CryEngine, right? Um, Figuring out all the stuff, kind of reverse engineering everything as we go. So it was all all trial and error, just like, I guess, any mod uh, any mod for any game back in the day. Uh, but yeah, it was mainly because of the, the, the time of um, when we were really interested in doing stuff. And, like, even with Battlefield 2142, when the, the concept was originally discussed, you know, they had, like, mechs walking around. Both Krim and I were just saying, like, hey, you know... Wouldn't it be cool if we just plugged in Battletech mechs <laughs> into uh, into this multiplayer game? <laughs> so yeah, born out of love. All right. Um. So yeah, and Invictus, how did you get started in uh, you know, this you know Battletech Mech Warrior thing as opposed to some other uh, some other Mecha franchise? Well, as I said, um. Mech Warrior 3 was prop was my second real PC game after Tie Fighter. We back when, like I guess when it was first released, 97, um, and I played the heck out of it. And then after I got bored with that, I usually just played 
um, strategy games like Command and Conquer, and then I never really played um, FPS games until Battlefield 1942. So it just all came together in just kind of a mix of games I actually liked. So I just ended up playing the heck out of this, and this is what really got me into, I guess, Battletech as a whole. Because 3 and 4, I I never really looked up any of the lore or anything. I didn't even know it was based off of a tabletop game. It was just those games to me. Yeah, I don't think I knew it was a, a tabletop game besides the Clicks game uh, until quite a while after I uh, noticed the franchise. Um, so then here's a question that... Uh, both of you will probably be able to answer. Um, and it, it always comes up uh, from the community. Uh, why not spend all of this effort on an original IP so that, you know, people could take donations or compensation of some kind? Uh, well, I don't know if it's changed since, um, like, I was involved. But in terms of direct donations that we were uh, able to receive. This was before, you know, the the kerfuffle with Piranha Games, obviously. Um, before all that, actually, the, the mod was able to actually receive donations and ad revenue. Um, I'm sure you guys could still receive ad revenue, but, you know, legally speaking, that would be something that uh, I guess you guys need to look at. Um, hiring a lawyer for it in terms of the Battletech franchise now. Um, but in terms of, you know, uh, crea uh, directly creating, like, a, a new IP to, you know, create um, something from scratch in order for receive donations, whatever. Uh, I mean, for, uh, in terms of, like, the, the ground assault Battletech-oriented stuff, that this is definitely something that I definitely want to do uh, come future development. Um, but of course, game development and sorting out um, payments for uh, developers. When you actually go to something that's for profit, it turns into something completely different. It's a very different beast uh, versus something that's you know made uh, out of uh, modding love and uh, something that's just more of for the fun of it and not really for profit, right? So there's a lot of legality uh, behind that. And, and I can speak from first-hand experience with that. Um, in terms of, like, creating my own IP since I've moved on from MechWarrior 11 Legends, I don't, I don't know if... Uh, but I am creating my own IP now, my own independent game. Uh, and you can check us out at solarwardengame.com. Uh, current with uh, Solar Warden, we are still uh, working out uh, a release time with it since we've actually... Kind of like MechWarrior Living Legends, uh, bit off a little bit more than we can chew. Um, so a lot of the development as well is still a uh, work in progress and trying to get more of the higher level RTS elements in uh, going forward. Uh, but we do have a demo out on Steam already, and uh, we will be putting that also on uh, Steam as soon as we're ready for release, and Alpha will be actually soon, .tm. <laughs> Um, let's see. So, uh, speaking about the, uh, new IPs and things like that, have you followed Mech Merc Company at all? No. So, uh, there was a, a player of, um, Living Legends, um, I believe he goes by, uh, Mick Shooters now, but I don't remember what his name was back then. He had a, uh, some sort of, uh, like Spartan helmet as his avatar back in the day, and um, he yeah he was an avid Living Legends player, and he went off and has created his own mech game. Uh, cool. Yeah, uh, I used to alpha test it for him occasionally. Uh, I haven't been following it very closely um, more recently, but uh, uh, it's in Unity engine though, so it's kind of uh, kind of weird. <laughs> it's uh, it's uh, definitely an interesting thing. Uh, I mean, you know, bes between Unity, Unreal, and CryEngine, it's it's less, uh, especially being able to have several years of AAA development experience under my belt. Um, the engine, in the end, is more or less what you do with what's provided. Like Unity and Unreal, uh, they're extremely comparable, where un Unreal it has a lot of things that are easily accessible right out, right out of the gate. 
like a lot of the rendering stuff, a lot of sprite uh, creation, um, like um, basics in terms of uh, lighting effects or whatever. All that, to my knowledge, is actually more plug-and-play in terms of using the um, a lot of the, uh, the community plugins in order to create like a lot of that stuff. Whereas I find like all that stuff uh, by default, like a lot of the baseline actors and stuff, that's all easily accessible uh, in, in Unreal. Um, now, CryEngine, on the other hand, like was uh, pretty prominent back in the day. I don't really much care for it now. Uh, back in the day, it was all like real time rendering. Real time, all the time was you know the sales pitch for Crisis. So real-time rendering, you know, real-time. Well, they didn't actually do reflections, but it was screen space reflections, which were real-time, blah, blah, blah. And so it took, like, Unreal and Unity a little bit of time to catch up to that. Uh, but now, in my opinion, it's actually uh, superseded that. But in terms of, like, you know, just Unity versus Unreal, really, there, there's not a lot of difference if you can get down into the minutia of the engine itself and create it how you want it, regardless. Um, but I will still say, you know, I am definitely holding the flag for Unreal because I love developing in Unreal. I find it a lot more streamlined to develop via Unreal, whereas Unity feels still a little bit more of like a dinosaur, which uh, CryEngine definitely is now. Hmm. But that's, yeah. you know, my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> So when you said um, like real time rendering, you're talking about how like textures and things aren't burned in. Is that it? Uh, well, you know, you could you could play that multiple different ways. So like, okay, for instance, do you know what tessellation is? Like real time tessellation. Mean, I know what literal tessellation is on like a like an MC Escher sort of thing, but I don't know what it is exact precisely in uh, uh, the sense of a um, okay. video game. So, uh, in terms of, for instance, like real time, all the time. Let's let's take tessellation uh, as an example, which was a brand spanking new thing. Uh, but I don't think we actually uh, implemented too much of it in MWL. I don't know if it ever uh, went forward. And I know like Krim was, uh, uh, and a few other developers were were dabbling with it. But essentially, like real time tessellation is it takes like a height map of a texture. Like textures themselves are something that are in all 3D uh, real-time game engines. There are a pre-baked two-dimensional image that's projected on a three-dimension... Uh, 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 a UV map that's like 3D... or sorry, 2D coordinates on three-dimensional faces on the side of a um, uh, 3D object, right? Mm -hmm. So that's, that's there by default, no matter what. But what in terms of, like, real-time rendering, what that means is, like, okay, how does, like, the light interact with it? Uh, how does the, does geometry change in relevance to that? So what, like, for instance, tes real-time tessellation, what that does is it takes a height map. So a height map is just, like, a black and white image superimposed onto uh, uh, a UV map onto the face of an object where it says, like, okay, add more polygons instead of, like, a low-poly asset, you know, let's let's take a mech, for example, they're, in general, like, 10,000 polygons, uh, or, yeah, 10,000 polygons, uh, I think, like, 20,000 triangles. Mm -hmm. And what it does is it subdivides it and adds more triangles and then reads from that height map in order to uh, add additional physical geometry detail. So the thing that was actually used uh, more so in order to test this was, like, things like bricks, so you could actually see bricks physically deform kind of as you got closer to them, uh, whereas when you went further away, it's like kind of like an inverse LOD, if you know what that means, yeah. reverse level of detail, where uh, LODs, when you get further and further away, you lose like more detail, you lose uh, polygons, and then if you have mitt maps on them, like the texture resolution goes down. It's more so for performance, so like far away, you don't need to know all this geometry information if you're not really, like, looking at this thing up close. Whereas if you're up close and you want to get, like, this super fine detail, that's when you instill things like, you know, uh, um, detailed normal maps, uh, you get dynamic tessellation, all that stuff, so you get more and more visual pop from a, uh, a physical uh, asset that's in front of you, rather than, you know, just a flat face that has um, some pre-baked, like, normal mapping in there to 
uh, that's at like a whatever resolution, but since you're so close to it, it just gets super pixelated and now it just turns turns into a blurry mess, right? But yeah, right. that's you know one example. Another one is like the biggest one that CryEngine had for the longest time that, uh, for instance, Unreal did not, uh, and Unreal had to fake a lot of it in order to say that they did have it, was real-time lighting. Uh, so for instance... In MechWarrior Living Legends, uh, one of our favorite maps that we did was ClearCut that actually had like a nice dynamic time of day, but then we also uh, used the same uh, time of day functionality that CryEngine had uh, uh, right off the bat to be able to create maps uh, uh, like Extremity, where you had the difference, and it also, uh, uh, based on uh, measuring the actual time of day, you had like differences in gameplay dynamics like, you know, uh, you had the colder night and then the hot uh, sections of the day, uh, completely roasting your mech. So it was really fun uh, aspects that we played with uh, right in the early early uh, development phases of of the mod. So I've got a question for uh, both of you, and <clears throat> it's a two parter. Um, so uh, I guess I'll start with Invictus. Uh, what is your favorite mech, tank, or aircraft? from the Wandering Samurai days of Living Legends, and what is your favorite mech, tank, or aircraft from the community development days? Oh, man. It probably changed over time because I've just played the crap out of all of them so much. Um, I think I used to run the Bushwhacker and the Uzeal the most, um, but when it really comes down to it, probably the, from the originals would be the Avatar, I guess. And then from the new stuff, gameplay-wise, I think my favorite mech in the game right oh. now is the Sunder. Even though it kind of looks like crap, it still is ideally suited for my playstyle. <laughs> Hopefully you guys can retool the Sunder, because I'm not a big fan of that zebra print myself. <laughs> <laughs> I think of all the new assets, probably the one that looks the best, um, especially texture-wise, is probably the Xerxes. I don't think the zebra print is the default for the Sunder. But, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. <laughs> the camo, I don't know if it... Yeah, I don't think it meshed very well. Uh, here's the uh... either way. I'm not. I'm not a fan of. Well, even the Sunder uh, from the original TROs looks terrible. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I don't know. It just looks like uh, uh, built out of Legos, really. Um, and it definitely needs a little bit more detailing. Um, but yeah, that's again my opinion. <laughs> so yeah, for yeah. Uh, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, it turned out to be way more low poly than I originally intended. So I think Chazar was still in the process of learning, and we've really never been able to correctly reproduce the high poly to low poly bake process that you guys used in the past. So it's always been either too messed up or too basic as to be really worth it. We've kind of struggled with that. So in the Sunder's case, mm. it was just, it was too basic. I, well, I mean, that's a matter of uh, dealing with um, just how to bake normal mapping and getting the cage proper. Um, there shouldn't be anything specific with CryEngine uh, needed to make that come out better. But, I mean, if you guys need help to get some pointers to make those things come out better, um, I'm here to help you guys out if you need. Yeah, I mean, Cesar basically taught himself from scratch basic modeling. Yeah. <laughs> Because we yeah, just didn't have, we didn't have any modelers for a long time, so he basically eventually just stepped up, and then I have to do most of the technical stuff in 3ds Max to just take the basic model and then work with it, and get it in the engine, which is just a whole big mess. Oh, I hear you. <laughs> I hear you. Um, I'm not sure if you guys still do uh, the with the pods. Um, do you guys still use the main template, or, or do you cut it down to only the helpers that you need and then export those out? Um, it's really it's dependent on each individual mech. Um, usually, yeah, gotcha. 
mechs that have don't we don't make arms for and that we just use the pod system to have the arms those usually have way more options than something like say the argus that just has the big missile arm and the big chunky arm and it, if you start messing with right. the, those it really doesn't look much like an argus anymore so we just kept that to more a basic template yeah yeah <laughs> i guess that's kind of the argument but to me, it was always interesting to see, like, for instance, the catapult, a replacement of the missile pods with, you know, something else. Uh, and that was the kind of the idea behind, you know, the pod system, being able to actually mount those out. But we never, like, created a hard rule set to, like, what makes sense. Like, for instance, like you said, on an Argus, you know, what would make sense to replace the, the arm with something else? Or would it be its own pod, for example? Yeah, and additionally, when you look at the tonnage and the what it's supposed to do and everything, it was actually pretty close to the bushwhacker. It's basically just a bushwhacker that I think it has the same pod space. It just has more armor. So right, and the bushwhacker already had a lot of flexibility. Sure, so like, might as well just have the Argus just be the Argus. Uh, this is a question that I have for you, Invictus. Actually, um, since it kind of, uh, I mean. I don't know if Kentax is actually going to ask this similar question, but like in terms of now progressing with the community stuff, so like back in the day with Wandering Samurai, when we created them, like when we initially created the mechs and the tanks and all the rest of the variants related to them, like we had ideas of what specific roles that we wanted them to be. Uh, how do you guys now deal with uh, like potential overlap and, you know, like, having some of the mechs or variants just be left behind because either they're, one, you know, unpopular, or two, they don't really have a role because there's there's new stuff that comes out and just kind of, like, overlaps that role and either is better or, you know, just because of novelty. How do you guys deal with that, being able to revive maybe, like, old older mechs or older variants? Well, when I first started um, in 0.8 and 0.9, the vast majority of the work I did wasn't really making new stuff. It was trying to make all the old stuff that wasn't very good up to par with all the old stuff that was good. So rather than... That's actually where I usually start with each patch I do. Um, I'll just worry about anything that's existing in the game that isn't performing well and getting that up to speed before I decide to introduce new stuff. Um, as far as mechs go... Yeah, there's a ton of mechs that people wanted, and even I wanted, that just, if they don't fill a very specific role, and they just, we can't really spend time to get them in. Um, for instance, I really wanted the champion, but when I took a hard look at it next to the Argus, the Argus was just going to do, the champion was just too niche. So the Argus was going to be more useful in more situations. And around that update, I think the Argus went out with also with the Rommel. And one of the old meta issues with the game was if you played pure tech, um, once you got later into the game, Interfere was way, way too slow. Because oh, Clan yeah. <laughs> was always able to fit bigger engines. So we had to look for a bunch of assets that were still armored, but f still fast. And when you look at in Battletech and, and the lore, on the Intersphere side, those actually don't exist very much on the upper tier brackets of tonnage. So we had to just kind of carefully pick and choose. So that Good. that alone um, rules out a lot of stuff. But when it comes to like other stuff like planes and tanks and uh, VTOLs, it's actually easier to pick stuff just because all that stuff is usually way more specialized from Battletech as it is. So we just pick something that we think we need, and then it's usually pretty straightforward from there. Like when we um, pick something for the Inner Sphere Hovercraft, um, the heavy one, to go against the Epona. I mean, there were like three or four choices, and it was, I think it came down to the Musketeer and the Regulator, and we just figured we could make a Musketeer variant for the Regulator. And it was pretty straightforward from there. I know that uh, one thing that uh, you've done a couple of times is take an old chassis and change the engine in it. Not 
unnecessarily on just one variant, but on literally every variant of that mech. I think you've done that to what the Chimera and the, uh, as well as the Avatar. Any other mechs? Um, I think those two are the main exceptions. I try to avoid. I always avoid um, swapping out engine speeds per variant. I think the one exception is that there's one partisan with a fusion engine that goes faster than the rest of them that all have ice engines, but that's about it. No, I the, try not... There's a Rommel try not to, and, uh, that has a, a more powerful engine, and then there's um, a Mithras with a downgraded engine. I um, can't remember if there are any others. I'm more willing to do it on tanks than I am on mechs. I don't like to do it on mechs. Because when you look at Battletech um, and you get past the art, um, once you start messing with fundamentals like engines and internals and stuff, there really is no difference between the 75, two 75 ton mechs that have two different names. Now, the reality is in a video game, the art matters because the hitboxes matter. So they'll always be different. But when you start breaking it down fundamentally, I still try to keep a certain amount of personality to each mech specifically almost specifically because um some the hitboxes art is much more forgiving for some mechs than others so if you have two identical 75 tonners that go the same speed and have similar loadouts and similar armor everyone's going to gravitate to the one that has the better hitboxes and one of the own you can try and offset that by and that has worse hitboxes, even though it technically goes to the same speed. Oh, you could give it more torso twist. Um, you could have it, give it a better turn rate so it can dance around better. There's things that you can do that definitely aren't mentioned in Battletech, but you can kind of fudge in the background in order to make things competitive. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I remember all about that. That was something we did with, uh, it's funny that you mentioned, like, you know, the Bushwhacker and the Uziel. Um, in terms of when we initially set those up, those were something that we were considering right off the bat and making sure that, uh, of course, you know, Uziel being a little bit lighter in tonnage. But that was something that we wanted to make sure was, like, uh, uh, c- take into consideration, like, turn rates, like you said, and then even adding... the only We didn't really touch a lot in terms of the uh, internals when it came to the variants, uh, but what we did do was very much set up like distinctive personalities in terms of like acceleration, turn rate, uh, even manipulated a little bit of jump jet or coolant and how much uh, fuel each one had. Uh, so like small subtleties of that, allowing people to, to really look at how they wanted to min-max their, their roles uh, allowed for that. And that's why I was wondering like if there was uh, a lot of obsolete variants that ended up going forward. A lot of the Things that people, when people talk about bad variants, um, what I've noticed over the years is that it really has little to do with the variant itself and more to do with what weapons it's leaning on. If the weapons it's leaning on are bad, um, it's almost always going to be considered bad. So I actually care more about looking at all the different weapons first and making sure they're all literally carrying their weight before I worry about changing variants. There's actually been quite a few variants and quite a few chassis over the years that I const- everyone constantly wants me to change them, but I won't until I get around to actually fixing what's fundamentally wrong with their parts. And then once that's done, everyone kind of forgets that they were bad and uses them and go- moves on to something else that they think is bad. <laughs> you can never satisfy the crowd. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of things that have taken years, years to get right. I remember the, uh, like, a lot of the assault mechs were kind of copy and paste as far as what they were supposed to do. Um, Like the the Mauler, the Atlas, and the Awesome, I think before 0.7, all went 53 kph. Um, They all drove about the same. So the only real difference was the Mahler had more guns, the Atlas had more armor, and the Awesome was just bad. And it it eventually had gotten around... 
Oh, yeah. hold on. The the thing with the awesome is uh, it was actually supposed to be the one with more heat sinks uh, than the Mahler or the or the Atlas. So it was tuned to be uh, like a laser boat or a PPC boat, um, and the Mahler was just like the more offensive version of you know the Atlas. And like you said, the Atlas definitely had more more armor, and the main kind of role of the Atlas was you know kind of like the the inner sphere assault herald where it also had the angel ecm um so there was a lot of uh relevance to that i don't know if that changed um after i left the project but hopefully uh, it didn't but in well, terms of let me let me just interject with the the speeds yes it was copy paste with the speed and that was mainly because atlas mauler and uh and awesome were all using the same legs so they were actually among the first uh, uh, mechs that were actually created to begin with, and so we had to make a you know a production uh, call on how to like get the most bang for our buck because it was trying to get the mech pseudo speeds to work with their animations. <laughs> so in order to get those to work, we uh, we did a copy pasta on that. So yes, you know, in terms of laziness on our part, but in terms of you know since we were already a year behind, we wanted to get the game out. And uh, we we plugged those all together. So hopefully, uh, it sounds like you guys fixed it since then. Yeah, the awesome goes 64 kph now. Um, it definitely couldn't go any faster animation wise, but I think it can pull off 64 kph and still look good. Since they were like the same legs and the same pelvis, um, how does that look any different than the Atlas or, or the Mauler? I think it just has a little more get up and go. I mean, all of the mechs sometimes slide a little bit when they're running, but it's definitely not noticeable enough in game to where it's jarring. Gotcha. And also, the taller mechs are always also always going to be able to get a little bit more speed without it looking weird, just because they have longer legs. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, for sure. That Especially was a, the chicken walkers. That was a huge problem with the Hellhound. I don't think anything faster than 97 kph with the short man leg, is, I don't think it's possible to animate without it looking completely no, terrible. Yeah. I don't like, I mean, I'm not a huge fan of how the Hellhound turned out animation wise. Um, the main problem with it is that when it's that short, it has to sprint. It has to sprint naturally and almost no other game, mech in the game actually sprints. They just walk fast. And walking fast was not going to work. I tried it, and it was just walking like a zillion miles an hour. It looked like it was sped up. In terms of sprint, are you talking about the gate? Are you talking about like the actual uh, blend spacing between like the running animation and the walking animation? Uh, it, it's more how many footsteps are in the gate of the max run. So the Hellhound actually has runs at full speed like a person would to where when you're at full sprint, your both legs kind of leave the ground at some point. Yeah, you're yeah. Either, but you're still I, using the differentiation is what I'm saying between walk animation and run animation, right? Yes, those look fine. Okay, um, yeah, it's, gotcha. It's just that at the max speed, both the commando and the hellhound have to sprint. And it looks a little weird right. in game because nothing else does that. I mean, when I look at it in a vacuum, it doesn't I, it doesn't bother me. Um, but when I look at it compared to everything else, when they're running in a pack with other things, it does look very different. Sure. But it was just well, that was I, that was something that uh, like we we uh, struggled with with early mech creation and and just the legs uh, was we didn't want you know the customized it went well. Uh, well, we'll get there, I guess, in terms of customization. But uh, what we didn't want to see was, like, for instance, you know, in MechWarrior 4, you had uh, tiny little light mechs, like the Raven or even the Flea, for example, uh, running at, like, 150, almost 200 kph and bouncing the cockpit so badly that, of course, you know, the person inside would die just from, you know, sheer... A blunt force trauma inside of the cockpit, no matter <laughs> if you had a five point harness or not. I mean, it it still just looks silly. So um, I, I understand, like, if you guys like extend on that, but 
that was something that we decided to do is like, okay, and just in terms of physicality, we wanted to limit their their speeds, you know, regardless of TRO. With the Anubis, yeah, I think it's, uh, uh, you see a bit of that shaking uh, at slower speeds. Uh, yeah, the two mechs that are a good example of that are the new mechs. One is the Argus. Um, we made the Argus before I reverse engineered how you guys exported the um, leg animations and made them and everything. Um, yeah. So there were several mechs that got included, the Argus, the Cauldron Born, uh, the Anubis. Before I had reverse engineered that, that we had to use all the old leg sets. So when I looked at the TRO art, um, the Argus legs actually look really, really similar to the existing Black Lantern legs. They're actually about the same size as they should be. So we decided to go with that. Um, but since the Black Lantern legs were designed to run really, really fast, um, when we had it only do 86 kph, it has like this really, really gentle gait. So it's like a super smooth ride. Um, the other example on the other end is the Anubis. <laughs> the Anubis uses the solitaire legs, which also are supposed to go really, really fast. Now, the Anubis itself is fast. It's 129, but the solitaire is 168. And one of the problems with the solitaire was it's, it's one of the mechs that we don't have the source file for. Oh, no. Vlad worked on it, and he never got us those sources. So I was never able to really know what I was getting into when I picked those legs for the Anubis. It was another situation where when I looked at the TRO art, you could argue that the Anubis legs are actually quite close to the solitaire legs that exist in game. So I decided to go for it. Right, and right. so the problem is kind of the opposite of when it goes fast, when it goes slower than the solitaire, it's walking really fast. <laughs> and uh, and, the, no. and the, um, the Anubis cockpit is in the center, whereas the solitaire cockpit's on the side. Further, yeah. Vlad, Vlad never actually put a solitaire cockpit in. It's just it's one of the few remaining mechs in the game that just kind of has a blank window. Um, and I think he did that because I don't think he could get it really looking right. And so the Anubis is an almost extremely vomit comet. I think it's probably... If I went back and tried to make legs for it, I could probably fix that. But just the simplicity of um, changing the solitaire legs animation since we don't have the source it's just more work than it's worth oh man yeah no I wondered with um, th this was something that even when I was working on it back in the day uh, I actually came up uh, I guess it was lost in translation because um, it was one of the last few things that I was doing before I left the project was uh, fixing uh, you, obviously the inclusive cockpit, right, uh, forces a restriction on the the way that the mech bobs in order to allow for, you know, a, a semi-coherent uh, ability to aim. <laughs> so if you're, you know, in the middle of a walk cycle, right, uh, from the exterior, the awesome and the mauler, I don't know if you guys fixed this, probably not, but like, you know, and the Atlas, they all look like they have sticks up their ass, so they're they're... Super rigid, super stiff. Uh, but what I did, I, I hope you guys still have the source files for the catapult, because uh, with the catapult, what I did is add a additional helper, which was a it was it was meant to be kind of like a uh, you know like shocks, for example. But it was uh, in relevance to the cockpit and the cockpit aim, allowing it to uh, maneuver ever so slightly uh, with I think like a 15 degree. Uh, additional bob to the animation, but still keep the the viewport uh, relatively stable while you're walking. So first person actually looked like it was still stable while you had a, a third person actual bob just to a slight extent. Uh, and I think we also applied that to the Owens um, was another one that we that we put that through. So I would uh, it would be awesome if you guys like you know took that further and being able to uh, expand on you know, having the the mechs not look so bad in terms of their sticks up their butts while they walk in third person. Uh, but you still, you know, get that same uh, smooth ride uh, from first person. 
Well, we've been able to, I think we used some sort of system that was left over to, because I worked a lot with a lot of the newer mechs um, once I had to make the animations of just tweaking them over and over and over until there was enough bob on the outside without it being a vomit comet on the inside. Yeah. I think the one axis that you really can't, we weren't able to work with was the X axis. So hip movement from side to side um, really throws the aim off. Up and oh, down, yeah. <laughs> like the Z axis and Y axis, especially the Z axis, just bobbing up and down. It's okay. There, I have a little bit on the Hellhound, a little bit on the Commando. There's quite a bit on the Fafner and quite a bit on the Solitaire. Um, but it that was really the one thing I wasn't able to because one thing that was interesting um, with the Kodiak I actually wanted it to kind of lean forward when it runs because when what you describe as the very um, rigid walks I kind of call it the Franken walk the, <laughs> especially on especially on um, man leg mm -hmm. uh, mechs mm -hmm. they're all the Atlas is always literally Frankenstein pose, has its arms out and walks straight up, and they all have to do that. Um, but the Kodiak, I was kind of hoping a little more closer to what you would think it would look like based off of the art and where it really leans forward into its run. Yeah, like a bear. Yeah, and gotcha. I, I was semi-successful. I think one of the problems was in order for it to really do that, the head actually needed to articulate itself. Um, and it's set up to do that, I think, in the scripts, but it I don't think I ever got it. I, it was something that I think you guys, someone, probably Defender, um, probably experimented with back in the day, but I don't think you really got it working. And so the leftover scripting and code and setup and the art and everything that I tried to base it off of um, really isn't quite there enough. I, I, yeah, no, it was something that I, I, I was actually setting up, and I think I showed Defender, because I was trying to show him actually how to do that, and then he was trying to pass that information on to Vlad. It's just funny, you know, how many, I guess, generations of developers that, you know, touch these things <laughs> that goes through. It's just interesting. But yeah, no, it was never our intent to, you know, leave, as you call the Frankenstein, you know, gate, and, and have those, because... Obviously, you know, uh, the, the mech setup is a hybrid. I, I, I've talked about this numerous times in the past. The, uh, the, the, the mechs themselves are a hybrid between, like, character legs and a tank torso. Uh, but, yeah, it was never our intention to, you know, f fixate on that. But because of the fact that we were trying to make it so that it was an inclusive cockpit rather than a... Um, how usually games do it with first-person shooters is they have a completely separate first-person uh, mesh, and then when you go into third-person, then you have a completely third-person character uh, that actually do end up have. well, obviously, for the most part, they have different animations because of the different skeleton. We never wanted that. Um, we wanted to make sure that all that was all inclusive all the time, so you had, like, that fully immersive experience, right? And we wanted that whole thing to be um, all in one. Um, but there's reasons, you know, why first-person shooters have that separation, right? It's to be able to have that uh, unique um, animation and have it look better in first-person and then have it more exaggerated in third-person because you're not actually controlling that, that character, right? So what you're saying with the way that uh, you set it up um, is that, like, if, say, you were a spectator camera and you were looking at a mech, and you were somehow able to get the camera to clip inside of the mech, you'd still be able to see the uh, uh, console the, in front of the character or the cockpit. You'd be able to see that uh, the same way a first-person player would. 100%. 100%. Um, you guys could probably still set that up for, like, camera views. Uh, I think GrindGen 2 is still allowed for that. It was like when you... Uh, either choose between orbit cam or whatever. You can have fixated or fixed like um, uh, spectator positions. You wouldn't get the HUD, of course, right? So because the HUD is all unique to the 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 client themselves. 
Um, but it's just, you know, feeding information to that. Uh, but essentially, yeah, you could have that same exact view as a spectator from oh, that would first be nice. person. I mean, yeah, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not developing the stuff, so I'm not <laughs> promising anything. <laughs> I'm just saying it's possible. Yeah, cool. one of the um, nuances of actually having the camera inside the cockpit is that there are several, I guess, types of mechs I'll go for um, when I order one up for the art. So there's like, there's open cockpit, closed cockpit, and no cockpit. Um, no cockpit, I guess, is the Atlas, um, is the best example right now. Um, I wasn't a huge fan of the bubble head. Um, oh, I'm sad. So <laughs> There's a lot of people that weren't. At first, we decided to go from bubble head to astronaut head and just have the visor be glass, but then cover the rest in a helmet. And, but after a while, it's like, eh, I'm just going to go for the full skull face. And it, so there's really, since you can't look in there, there's really nothing in there. On the solitaire, it's the same way. And then there's mechs where there is an inside, and you can see inside from the pilot's point of view, and everything that the pilot can see out, all the consoles in front of them, and all the geometry in front of them. I had it all UV'd and textured, but the window itself is opaque. So when you look in there behind the pilot, none of it's textured. It's just blank geometry. And then there's mechs where usually ones with very big windows where I decided, well, let's go ahead and just do everything in there. So you can actually look in there. The cauldron board is a good example. Everything's textured in there. There's a chair. There's, you can, there's, I think there's even some accessories back in there. So it usually comes down to which, just the size of the cockpit in the mech and how much the artist is willing to put in the work. Yeah. And in the end of the day, you know, it is, again, a mod project, and people are doing this on a volunteer aspect, so you can't expect them all to, you know, finish everything 100%. And, you know, we had the same thing, too, when it came to um, even the – some of the first patches that we were creating, like the Nova Cat, uh, I don't know if you guys ever finished the, or if the cockpit was ever finished, probably not. The inside of the Nova Cat cockpit is just a black area, uh, and all you see is through, the, like, the slit. And <laughs> funny, I think yeah. the Warhammer has the same thing. I did actually get a Nova Cat cockpit texture in, finally. <laughs> but I actually oh, kept, sweet. Nice. I kept, I kept forgetting about it for, like, two patches. Because I worked on it, and I kept forgetting to actually put it in. But I hey, did that's cool. put it in. And I'll another thing is that with almost with, I think, alone, only the Marauder um, was done by an artist ground up by one guy. Like, all the work usually gets handed off so many times. And um, so the cockpit texture is always done last, and it's always done by me. Because I never really bother, especially artists who are still in the learning process. I just try to get them to basically do what they know. And then all of our texture guys are always so part-time that I don't bother them with extra stuff. So it usually comes down to just me pasting something together when it comes to yeah, texture. Gotcha. No, that's awesome. I'm glad to hear the Novacat finally got a cockpit. <laughs> yeah, the only thing I don't like about it is that I, there's a lighting issue with it because this was before I kind of understood how the normal maps were working. And so before I was able to clean that up in the material, um, I noticed one side was always darker than the other. So I just decided to go with the crappy solution and go into the diffuse texture itself and just kind of brighten it up on one side. But when I went back and actually fixed the material, now it's, screwed up the other way and it got to the point where it's just I stopped messing with it but it <laughs> that and oh, it is annoying. it is just a basic texture there there are screens on it but because I didn't go back and uh, cut out geometry in order to give the screens different material IDs in order to give them lighting and all that most of the newer stuff we've been able to build like that but a lot of the older stuff we just had to do basic and I do plan on probably going back and eventually finishing all the blank ones. 
it's just it always depends on what we have the source for and just what I have time to do. Yeah, for sure, I get it. So uh, another thing I think that uh, occurred over time with um, variant changes, uh, you know, with what we were talking about earlier, um, and this I think was during the Wandering Samurai days that the that these changes mostly took place was uh, moving away from very heat heavy builds. Uh, like I'm just looking at. Um, some of the old variants, like uh, there's a Shadow Cat with four ER large lasers and one ER medium laser. Like that thing would just melt nowadays. <laughs> For the really old stuff, I think some of that's proof of concept to where even in the when they, it was actually playable in game back in the day, they still didn't have those. Mm. Uh, no, I vaguely remember that one because I think that one had a uh, the bipods. But yeah, like you were saying, it was more of a proof of concept because uh, we were testing out the pod system heavily, and you know the Shadow Cat, uh, Shadow Cat was eel, catapult, uh, Mark II. Mark II was a big one uh, that we were playing around with. If we were playing around with the pods, um, like we were really stressing, you know, how could we get to the nth extent of these? Prime example, I go back to my beat stick. <laughs> Four LBX20. Four LBX20. Uh, I still say that you guys could rip off armor to make that work, or rip down the engine. You could strip the whole thing to make that work, but whatever. Um, but again, you know, it came back to we were less uh, inclined to follow strict TROs. Like, you know, as you already are mentioning the fact the difference between like the the TROs and tabletop versus the actuality of you know f- uh, piloting a mech in real time. There's vast differences and things that that occur uh, in terms of rule sets, right? Um, so this is kind of tangential, but like for one of the complaints that we had from purists is like, oh, why don't we have you know crit rolls when you're shooting at something? And I said, no, that's stupid. Because of the fact that if you're physically aiming at something, you're going to physically hit it, right? There, there's no random chance when it comes to having a laser uh, physically pointing and shooting at something. It's going to hit where you aim it. Now, of course, there is a random chance roll uh, you could have in terms of, like, recoil or spread on a ballistic weapon, of course, of course. And that's already there and accounted for, but there's no reason to have, you know, uh, a ra- like a stupid random chance dice roll for no reason. Um, but anyway, what what I was getting at is like in terms of those early early variants, um, it was more of a matter of the rule of fun rather than um, following the exact pure uh, rule sets that were established. Right. So it was more about flexing the 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 availability. But of course. Um, it's all a matter of balancing those rule sets and making sure that all the variants, uh, again, had a role to play. Do you recall the Light Goss Fafnir? Uh, I wasn't there for that. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, so there was a, a Light Goss Fafnir. It had uh, one Light Goss in each side torso and one Light Goss in each arm. Uh, it also had a, two medium lasers and Bloodhound Probe on top of that. And it was just... Uh, just horrifyingly good even though its <laughs> dps was way lower than basically any other fafnir it was able to put you know four light goss into one component on an enemy mech at 1200 meters i think that was well i don't know who made that that variant but that as well as the uh, rotary auto cannons uh, i remember um defender showing me videos of the the rack fafnir as well um running around, and I think those were like, uh, kind of callbacks to the beat mech, <laughs> but in their own style, in their own Bodhi ways, right? Like, you know, the four light goss, and four rotary auto cannons, that kind of crap. Uh, but yeah, it's just funny. Funny to see that, you know, uh, having, having developers after me come in and, um, well, first, it was like bitching about how this is overpowered, and then they create their own overpowered uh, mechs and variants. Yeah. <laughs> but hey, whatever. I'm not. I'm not gonna, you know, dwell on that. The um, 
uh, there was also the Shiva, because there was like the Beatstick Shiva that had two LBX-20 and two LBX-10. Uh, was that during your time? Holy. N- no. Uh, but I also remember uh, after after me, there was the uh, the Heavy Goss Shiva, and I was like, oh my god, that's just silly. <laughs> there, there, uh, it seemed like there was no other reason Um to play on their, any other aerospace, if you're doing a bomber, yeah. than the uh, than the heavy Goss Shiva. I don't know if you guys still have that guy in there. Um, there's a Shiva with one improved heavy Goss now. Uh, oh, okay. What's weird? That's not as bad as two. What's so weird though is that the two heavy Goss Shiva um, is not actually that far off from an actual cannon variant. There was a cannon variant with two improved heavy Goss. <laughs> Yeah, see, that's just silly. Uh, I remember when uh, we created the the Heavy Goss and we had the Heavy Goss um, Hollander, uh, and by itself was just super overpowered, especially early game, being able to grab that pretty quickly. I think even out of the gate, you could buy that. Yeah, I think at the beginning there was the the Rack 5 and UAC 2 Hollander was the one of the few ones you could afford but yeah like with just a small donation you could grab uh that uh heavy goss yeah. one yeah um, yep yep uh, yeah the uh the Shiva uh I think it's much more ba- fair now it's not nearly as awful uh, as it used to be and um yeah also speaking to other variants that like are canon and are absolutely ridiculous. There's like a six LRM fifteen Nova Cat in canon. Yeah, like what? What? What's that about? <laughs> it's so it can keep firing they, even okay, after it loses an arm. When they had like no concept. Well, sorry. Let me let me just <laughs> jump in here. When they had no concept of actually like physically changing the models in relation to that, like where would you put that? Like you would have like a a. a a bipod of LRM 15s stacked on top of each other on either arm. And then where you would put like, you would randomly pull out of your ass, like, you know, two additional what shoulder mounts or shove them in the torso somehow. Like what? That's stupid. (laughs) I think I saw a custom built model of it once that had great big, uh, like almost briefcase sized hands, you know? Yeah. And that's no, that's just ridiculous. Right. So again, going with throwing shade at the TROs again like those TROs they were just making up crap because they had like some the rule set set up for the tonnage right and this is where I say like there 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 is TROs that do stretch the limit of those and there are certain things especially on a real time game that you you shouldn't do right like I don't know for instance I, I really wanted to uh, instill a um, uh, rule set actually onto the, like for instance the Goss right where I felt like Goss itself was a little bit overpowered in terms of the damage output and the range that I was doing that I wanted the Goss to actually lose uh, speed over time right and then also with that speed over time it could also lose uh, the the actual physical damage that it would that it would do uh, over a distance. Um, so in that way, you would actually have a differentiation between the auto cannons, right? Uh, and then even for like maybe the amount of power that you put into it, uh, you would have uh, a differentiation of that, and then the heat generated with that. So it'd be kind of like a hybrid between, you know, uh, uh, physically a, a hybrid between like a laser and an auto cannon, but um, not either one or the other, because it feels like a lot of the auto cannons kind of fell short afterward. Um, because obviously the auto cannons are a lot slower than the Goss, but I just felt like, yeah, of course, with heavy Goss being wielded everywhere and just turning, having heavy Goss being basically anti-air because you know they're nearly instant in terms of their shot and their speed, just made them silly. <laughs> yeah, I still get shot down with heavy Goss pretty darn easily. Yeah, and that's that in my mind is just silly. One of the balance points of the Goss on aircraft. Actually, we pretty much solved it by giving them a slight charge time. And that would be heresy. There if, you they go. Were on, if they were on the ground, that would be heresy. But since almost all the aircraft weapons actually work very different from the ground versions, when I did the big arrow rework in uh, 0.9 maybe, that, mm-hmm. Was, mm-hmm. that was one of the main things I did is 
almost all the weapons are completely different. I mean, the DPS is still similar. The heat generation is still similar. Um, so you can, within the class, you can call it, still call it that, but the way it mechanically works is usually completely different. And Goss usually came down to, we just put um, a charge yeah. time on it. Because it got, so, I've actually had to make the charge time less because the initial numbers I went to, it only takes like a second and a half of charge or even a second of charge makes it way harder to use. Oh, yeah. We uh, uh, probably, you didn't know about this, but um, prior to release, uh, I actually fought uh, and lost the battle of having PPCs uh, have a charge on them um, because of just their, their destructive capability. Um, PPC was one of the the few weapons uh, that did both EM damage uh, to fuck with your HUD as well as uh, splash damage that didn't rely on ammo. Uh, so, of course, you know, you have the auto cannons, especially AC-20s, and a little bit of AC-10s having their, their splash radius, but PPCs having their big splash radius did a hell of a lot of damage uh, along all the torsos, right? Um, so in order to kind of compensate for that, I wanted to instill a uh, charge... Um, uh, on on the prior two in terms of firing them, uh, but holy crap, did I get a huge blowback uh, having that? And I finally, you know, said, "All right, fine, we'll do this, but we'll have to reduce uh, their splash radius." Um, but now I, I don't. Well, I don't know where the PPCs are at in the current meta. Um, but in in terms of where we initially were setting, it, oh yeah, the PPC also did heat, so it was kind of like a big kind of catch-all. So it felt very overpowered, but at least it's slower than the Goss. Um, so at least you had that in terms of it. So, but anyway, uh, it's just interesting to see the kind of same mechanics kind of come into play against uh, certain weapons that, you know, uh, require a little bit of a nerf hammer. What's funny about the heat damage from the PPCs is that that code actually, for some reason, stopped working for years. Are you kidding me? So it was just kind of sitting there, and I never messed with it. All of a sudden, in one of the patches, maybe 0.9 or 0.8, um, it woke up for some reason. So all of a sudden, people were able to basically one-shot kill anything using like <laughs> the, four, the four PPCs on the awesome because it would overheat everything instantly. And that was one of the <laughs> first times that we had to do a hot fix that was like the next day because it just completely broke the game. Eventually it came down to I just removed it. They don't do heat damage anymore. Oh, that's sad. <laughs> oh, that's funny though. I wonder I wonder why it stopped working and then started working again. Well, no, were were flamers like no longer effective then? No, the flamers still worked, but for some reason the PPCs just didn't it didn't activate. I think there was something wrong with the PPC ammo for XML for a long time, and that might have been it's possible. It's possible. I don't know. Whatever. <laughs> so I brought up the uh, the Goss Fafnir, the Light Goss Fafnir earlier, and um, uh, I had wanted it back, and uh, you know everybody in the um, various variant discussion channels and stuff was very rightly saying, "No, Kent Tax, this is a bad idea. This is a bad idea. Don't add this back in the game." And so I thought, tried to think of a bunch of different ways to try and get a Light Goss Fafnir back in the game. And Invictus kept telling me, no, you can't have Light Goss in the side torsos. The, it's, um, the Light Goss is too small of a weapon. It just isn't really appropriate to have such a small weapon in such a gigantic side torso uh, as the main weapon there. And so uh, I eventually came well, that up... that I agree with. Yeah, I eventually came up with this uh, variant that had light goss in the arms and regular goss in the side torsos. And and before uh, I let everyone else comment on it and that, I, I said, okay, before you all go off about how this is even worse than the light goss Fafnir and how it has even more pinpoint damage than it used to, remember, it doesn't shoot out to 1,200 meters and the travel time is slightly different between these two different weapons and so it's not going to be quite as reliable as that Light Goss one. Plus it doesn't have bl uh, Bloodhound Probe and it doesn't have the backup medium lasers. Uh, and even then uh, it, it got shot down and 
just magically in the last uh, couple weeks uh, it came up as a conversation topic again even when I I hadn't said anything in a long time maybe Invictus you can I actually put it in because I came at it from the other direction I had tried so many different variants that had just basic two Gauss rifles and I tried so many backup weapon combinations with those two Gauss rifles and none of them were any good I think Inner Sphere Gauss is so heavy that at 15 tons, it's if you're going to go all in, the H Gauss is 18 tons. So just that little bit of extra tonnage, there's if you can choose between the two, there's just like no contest. Um, of course, on Clan, dual Gauss is worth it because they're 12 tons a piece. So that's so much lighter. Um, but it basically came down to that was the only variant I could think of that would actually have a purpose and be good with the dual gauss because dual gauss by himself on a fafter it's just not worth it dual gauss on something like a mauler would be great but on a fafter no it's not enough and to talk about the fafter for a second when it just on the topic of variants the fafter is actually a good example of house rules that kind of the internal build rules that I use um most Fafners that people want are not actually Fafners. They're Annihilators, which is... <laughs> uh, yeah, that's true. Which is four large weapons. I want four AC-10s. I want four rack... The old, the old four rack five one doesn't exist anymore because I figured rack fives are not big enough weapons to put in the torso. So there's still ones with rack fives in the arms, but there's no rack four in the torsos. The torsos have to have big weapons in it because that is the entire point of the factor. And so even though I, the Annihilator isn't planned, when you, to go back to how we choose what to put in the game, if I allowed times four large weapons on the factor, the Annihilator would be completely pointless. So I reserve that in there for that the factor is there to boat two assault weapons and then have backups. If you want four large weapons, especially ballistic weapons, you're going to have to go with the Annihilator. So, Annihilator win? Probably never. <laughs> <laughs> but it's that sort of discipline that you have to maintain or else there's almost no point to adding new assets at all when you have such a modular system if you can just kind of fake it so you have to draw a line at some point. Oh, one of the other big changes I noticed um, post Wandering Samurai was uh, like requiring specific equipment on certain chassis. So, uh, for uh, for example, the um, Black Lantern had always had mask on every single variant, um, but that was from Wandering Samurai days. Shadow Cat, the Shadow Cat did not, but now. Every single Shadow Cat has jump jets and mask. Correct. Both the Shadow Cat and the Owens, back from the Wandering Samurai days, the original days, were problem mechs. They were just straight up better than everything else around their weight class. And I tried various things to fix this um, without quote unquote nerfing them. And it basically came down to the fact that both mechs in CBT actually have fixed equipment. So the Owens has a tag and a bat fixed on every single one. And the Shadow Cat has both Mask and JJ fixed on every single Shadow Cat. And when I did that, it basically, quote unquote, fixed the variants that were too good at what they were doing and had to have them draw back a bit. So some of the Shadow Cats that just had way too many weapons, um, they had to draw back because it just the fixed equipment ate up just enough tonnage to where you couldn't quite stuff as much stuff as you could anymore. Yeah, no the uh, ERPPC Shadow Cat, for example, uh, it still exists. Um, it still has jump jets like it used to, but now it has mask, and that me- meant that it something had to be cut somewhere, and now it has fewer heat sinks, and so it is a hot box. Yeah, so it's still in, but it's not nearly as dominant as it used to. And fixed equipment is actually pretty rare. I think that it's just the Owens 
um, the shadow cat and then the avatar has to have its two medium lasers. They can be different kinds of medium lasers, but they have to be. And then the Thantos has a guardian. Well, that that's more a, one of those for free perks. Ah. Do you still have um, hard LRM slots like on the Cougar? Or do you have variants that have like SRMs on them? Oh, as long as they're missiles. Right. Yeah, I so you're we... never actually switching those out into like some sort of non-replaceable gun. Because no, that would be one thing that I would do in disowning this project is if you have, you know, PPCs coming out of a um, catapult ear. <laughs> yeah, no, we never, we've never done that. If it's missile holes, it has to be missiles of some kind. Gotcha. Yeah, no, I'm happy to hear that. And I also try and keep it within reason of if it's a fixed missiles, um, holes in the geometry, if there's five holes, I can't bring myself to make an LRM-20 come out of it. Maybe a 10, but there, there's certainly nothing like an, an MRM-30 is not going to come out of five holes. Thank goodness. <laughs> I remember uh, in some of the early versions of MechWarrior Online, I had a Raven that uh, the intended ch- uh, this particular Raven chassis was intended to have a NARC launcher, and so it only had one hole, and so you could put an LRM-20 in that arm, and it would just go <laughs> constant. That's dumb. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I have no idea how how they restricted that for the geometry on MWO, but I'm sure that they made made some screwiness with that. The Argus and the um, uh, Mauler have, I think, a little bit of an exception compared to some of the uh, other mechs in the game, because uh, they're able to mount... uh, Well, I guess the Catapult does, too, now. They're able to mount more than one missile launcher in that... uh, Like, in the Argus's arm or in the the Mauler's uh, stacks. There's a funny story about that. Um, It's actually become a headache. The probably first, before I was on the Alpha team, way back when King Lear was in charge, um, probably the first quote-unquote change I indirectly, I guess, encouraged in the game was the, all the LRM launcher sizes, the 5, the 10, 15, 20, all had the same DPS and the same lock time. So when you looked at them, the bigger ones were always going to be better. And so you had stuff like the Owens Prime. The old Owens Prime had two LRM-15s, which it's supposed to have two LRM-5s. And so the way they had worked back then is that trying to have a couple of LRM-5s was never going to be worth it. You had to have at least four for it to be worth it. So I made a, a long form post saying, look, if you just make them lock on quicker and refire quicker, to have quote unquote better DPS, even though they have less burst, um, they'll be worth it. And that actually did get it into the game, the next patch. Well, years down the line, that worked fine, but now I've run into a situation where th- there's a few select variants, particularly like the Thor Prime is a good example, which CBT only has one LVX 10, one LRM 15, and the RPPC. For it being that late in the game and that heavy, that's not a very good loadout. So what I essentially decided to do was like, look, three LRM-15s is better than one, or three LRM-5s in this system is better than one LRM-15. So the current Thor Prime basically has stacked three LRM-5s in its launcher rather than a single LRM-15, which from a CBT standpoint is perfectly fine. And technically from an art standpoint is as well is perfectly fine because it still has 15 holes. But from a build rules perspective, it's actually gotten me into some trouble now because now I'm in the situation where stacked small launchers are actually better than bigger launchers and I'm having to go back and rethink it again. Of how am I going to make the bigger launchers worth it over stacked smaller launchers besides just saying you can't do that on most variants? Well... Uh, just a format of advice, because I, I love I love the idea uh, on the face of it, 
because I think it makes a ton of sense, and I'm surprised we didn't think of it. <laughs> um, but just kind of falling out of the system, what would make sense then is it's bulk versus price, right? So what I would probably look at doing is, like, if you have, you know, three LRM5s versus an LRM15, you know, make them a half a ton uh, differentiation, right? Kind of like what you already see with the, the the auto cannons. So in terms of just the 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 setup of that, um, if you have like the LRM 15s, you know you get more uh, free tonnage based off of that. So of course that's going to allow for either more armor, whatever, right? Um, in terms of that, that's how I'd probably approach it, because you know obviously there's there's more that falls out of the system than just sheer firepower. And I'm sure you're very keenly aware of that dabbling with the uh, uh, internals, right? Because the TROs by themselves don't make mention of like how much armor uh, these things have. So my thought was always with the Thor, because the Thor by itself, regardless of us implementing it or not, uh, back in MechWarrior 4, the Thor was my favorite mech. Um, and... Uh, in terms of just the implementation of it, I'm surprised you guys also didn't stretch out the uh, uh, torso weapons as well on uh, <laughs> additional mounts for there. But maybe um, that was a, a discussion as well. Thor source we have is corrupt. <laughs> so, so the one we got from Defender, um, it, I cannot get it to re-export. Basically, there's so much wrong with it um, that any time I try Honestly, to change it, well, this is just you know on the podcast, and I guess I don't I don't care if Defender hears this, but honestly, I think uh, Defender's Thor looks looks like balls. I don't like it. <laughs> I have to say, even though it's both of our favorite mechs, I don't I don't like what he what he turned it into. Yeah, I so I, I honestly think that you guys should remake that model. It's pretty widely considered to be one of the only things that would be worth completely remaking the model for. Because yeah, pretty mm-hmm. much everyone thinks it looks pretty ugly. And that and it's, it's bugged as well. It has a, a very old radar bug to where you, when you're finding it, it's suddenly it'll be outdated and it kind of has its own cloaking device. And since the source is so corrupt, I can't really fix that from the art or from the 3DS Max source. I've tried to mess with it in the script, but I think it's actually a helper problem. So, yeah. Uh... We, can't even, we can't even do basic stuff like adding another helper to Put another weapon on it. It's just it has to stay as is, unless oh, we man. completely redo it. Uh, one one thing I never played with. Uh, I guess I never really. Um, well, okay, hold on. Here, here's another thing you can do. You can actually force a helper into the script. You realize that, right? Yeah, that's what I eventually. Work. That's what I eventually did to put um, weapons on or laser anti missile systems on the riflemen. Because we didn't have the source for the rifle, right? So I eventually right. figured out how to do that. Um, yeah, yeah. Because it's a it's a helper uh, subsection in the XML that you can actually apply those to. Uh, but then you also have to be wary about where it's parented, because um, otherwise it doesn't actually follow the torso during the torso twist. So you have to actually parent it to a bone. I want to say that there is a reason why I haven't gotten around to doing that, because I have tried it. I've done it successfully in other mechs, but I forget something is wrong with the Thor to where it doesn't work. Weird. That's weird. Sounds like maybe I need to come on for a little bit just to help you problem solve a few of these issues. Crying <laughs> <laughs> uh, annoys the shit out of me, though. It might be an X-form problem. I think there's something really wrong with the whatever... Ooh. He exported it. Well, yeah. Yeah, no. <laughs> I'm sure you've run into this, too, where, you know, without resetting the X form properly, and, you know, via Max, you have to actually do the reset X form, not just, you know, transform reset, rotation reset, all that, all that nonsense. Because it doesn't actually reset the bounding box, and you need that properly to line up, for one, with scale, and two, with getting, you know, the proper uh, uh, setup for the animations, right? So then otherwise CryEngine, you know, flips its shit and either you have a really tiny mech or things, you know, turn all weird or, you know, you name it. (laughs) I'm sure you've run into that problem. Yeah, that and you have to completely unbreak all the hierarchy before you do it. 
or else it yes, gets very active. exactly. Uh, there is there is a way around it, and I can actually show you how to do that in Max because I do that a lot now. Yeah, I, I'm stuck with the Max 2013. It's the last one that will use the CryEngine. Uh, it should before. still it should still work with uh, 2013 Max. Anyway, that's neither here nor there. <laughs> <laughs> I just ah, <laughs> I just saw the uh, the picture you posted with the Nova Cat. <laughs> and the, and the <laughs> oh come on, that's basically a longbow, guys. <laughs> <laughs> All the LRM15s. That's oh my god. The armor Speaking of longbow, when <laughs> <laughs> armor distribution would be a nightmare on that thing, and that's another thing that um, well, it is in CBT, I guess, but it's not really that well stated. Is another thing is when you have two different mechs with identical armor, um, but different art, you can't just go with, with the same armor and distribution by default. Because if one has a, a giant left arm and a tiny right arm, the other one has two equal arms. Um, if you have the standard armor distribution, um, one of them is always going to be worse. So you basically just have to say, look, I'm going to put more armor on the big arm and less on the small arm. Not only does that make logical sense, but it's kind of required for the thing to be viable. And that's another thing that I've kind of learned over time and had to do a lot of, and a lot of mechs that were quote-unquote underperforming. It's just when you make a mech and you try to have a cookie-cutter armor system um, and the art's completely different, some of them are just going to be flat out better than others. And I have to go back and just tune the armor distribution to the reality of did that happen a lot with, um, say, like the uh, Solitaire and the Chimera and the Hollander? The Hollander was a very early example and a kind of an easy one. But there's been other ones here lately that are, I guess, less obvious, but still important because it was more, why is this, why does everyone kind of feel this mech isn't that great? And there was usually a pretty subtle reason. The Uziel actually, oh man, the Uziel had to be changed a lot. I mean, it's still there, um, but it's actually a little smaller than it used to be. And then it had to be squished a little bit because it was still too wide. And it still looks right, but just various reworks for armor distribution, the speed at which it can turn, all that stuff. Because from the original um, setting with it, it was just not worth it compared to the Bushwhacker. The Bushwhacker was always going to outperform it just because it's a sleeker and has more armor and actually has more weapons. It has more everything. The difference between 86 kph and 96 kph, especially in the middle um, tier of tonnage, is so subtle that it's almost never going to be worth it. So it still has, it still goes 97 kph, but it had to be a lot of work to go around that to try and make it worth it. And the Camara is a good example of, I couldn't make it worth it. At 40 tons, the difference between 97 kph and 86 kph was like a ton and a half of armor. And it was just so vulnerable for so long that I, that's one of the situations I just had to give up and say, look, the Camara just has to go 86 kph. So it can kind of be a total analogy with the Cougar, which also goes 86 kph at 35 tons, which is even smaller. Mm -hmm. Well, you have the uh, uh, Uziel. I th still think it's so amazing how the side torsos fall off on it when it gets shot up. That was something we did way back in, you know, 0 0.1. That was something I set up. <laughs> uh, it was... Uh, the idea behind that was to have more... Um, more mechs have side torsos and even middle torso, like, panels, like, falling off, and that the Uziel itself to have the torso fall off like that was just a proof of concept because that was one of the uh, only early uh, mechs that we had that had like torsos that looked like it could fall off pretty easily and quickly um, because technically we actually don't replace the model. Uh, I think it's still just an attachment um, that we just send a uh, signal to to say, hey, if this is destroyed, now detach this this part of it. 
Um, we do the same thing for the arms as well as the, you know, the, the, the cat ears for the Mad Cat and the Mark II. Uh, it's just also set up for the, uh, the Uzeal that way. But yeah, the plan was always to have uh, like armor uh, pieces or panels uh, fall off. Uh, but we didn't have, like, any of the mechs have any exposed interiors, um, and we didn't have any of those models. So we didn't want to set that up without, you know, physical models there in inside of that, right? Um, but, you know, that would have been uh, something cool to, to create, um, going, making uh, making a different game. <laughs> yeah, the, the system is still there to where we could almost do whatever we want with it. It's just been a case of, you know, part-time self-taught modelers. There's just we're trying to keep it as basic as possible, and that starts getting into a whole. Oh yeah. Uh, another thing I was thinking about was um, the how there's more uh, standard engines I think in the game now than there used to be. Is that right, Invictus? Yes. Yeah, so actually, I had to make quite a few changes for them to be worth it, because MWLL as it was. Um, didn't do the whole destroyed side torso from an XL engine means you're dead. Um, they decided to go instead with a tran higher transfer rate. So I believe the original was... Yeah, that was like, something we did in zero one. It's two times, and then for the standard engine, it's times one. Um, if that was somewhat justifiable um, in edge cases like the Atlas because it has max armor anyway. So you have so much armor on the CT that if you take out a side torso at a time for one modifier, it's going to take forever. Um, but there's we've since then introduced other mechs that are much smaller and much lighter. The Hellhound has a standard engine. The Locust 2C has a standard engine, even at 25 tons. Um, and it, the basic times one um, has worked, but since then I've also reduced the back torso modifier. So I think it's down to 1.5. It used to still be 3. Um, and then here lately, I've also changed the speed loss from back torso. So if you have a standard engine, if you get your back shot out, I think it's like 70% speed rather than 50%, which is what XLs are. Yeah, I'm happy that you guys uh, did a lot more rule sets for internals. Um, cause that's something we never got a chance to, to tackle. Um, well, when I was still part of the project, um, I don't know how far King Lear got with it, but it sounds like a lot of this stuff was just holdover and they just added more, more mechs and didn't really care about the rules rather than go for purist, um, TRO specific, uh, armor distribution and whatnot. But yeah, like, I'm I'm really glad that you guys are taking like a more, I guess, holistic approach uh, to it and saying, like, okay, hey, we need something more than just, like, damage modifiers <laughs> and having more. Like, I love that. I love hearing that there's more nuance to the damage um, the damage model, I guess. And, and another how actually uh, plays out. thing that uh, I think uh, Invictus has really uh, uh, shot for is balancing for pure tech. And, uh, I mean, it still, of course, has its issues, and it'll never be exactly right. Um, but one of the things I know that he was talking about was the asymmetrical parity, or whatever they call it. With the, um, So, Clan has <clears throat> only one jump jetting uh, uh, heavy mech in the game, which is the Thor. Uh, whereas Inner Sphere has the Catapult, the Avatar, and the Thanatos, all capable of mounting jump jets. Um, but then at the same time, there are no um, inner sphere mechs with ma or inner sphere heavy mechs with mask that can go uh, anywhere near as fast as the clan heavies with mask. Uh, for example, the the two inner sphere heavy mechs with mask are the rifleman and the avatar, neither of which are fast heavies. They're you know sort of middling when it comes to uh, speed and so the mask doesn't really give them as much of a bonus as say the Loki or the Cauldron Born on the clan side because their mask makes them real fast, uh, it, which doesn't you know doesn't translate over to the slower inner sphere heavy mechs. Uh, well, this this was something that 
I would probably pose to Invictus and they can probably uh, field both of these kind of questions is in terms of the rule sets for pure tech, um, like even with the, at zero one, we were still kind of wanting to have the inner sphere on kind of a meta game. You know, the, the idea versus like of Russians that have, they, they feel like a ton of people and they just, you know, throw everything out there and it's not really quality. It's more quantity versus quality. And I was thinking of the same thing in terms of like inner sphere versus clan, right? So even represented in terms of the C bill balancing, like uh, for the most part, um, when we when we first laid out for the cost ramifications of when you can actually buy, you know, the next tier, medium, heavy, assault, usually it's going to be the inner sphere mechs before the clans. And honestly, in terms of pure tech, maybe that should just be exemplified. Uh, and then even further to that, why not look at it? Same thing, you know. You have, as Zap Brannigan says, I send wave of wave of men at your disposal. <laughs> <laughs> have the inner sphere maybe set it up so that you have the balancing of teams where clan have may, maybe it's a one one to four disadvantage, right? So you have uh, four inner sphere versus one clan. And then that way, like for for clan, also I remember in terms of like the the history and the actual um, either reading up on the books or reading up on like the, the the stories behind it, they would do that in terms of for their honor sake and to test their own you know prowess or whatever in in battle. Uh, some ideas of having um, going forward with with a balancing in terms of pure tech that would be something you guys could explore maybe. And then even, you know, if you really wanted to go into it, have it in terms of, like, restrictions based on uh, time frame. So, like, the Uziel actually didn't come in to, like, post-clan. Um, so you could even restrict, like, certain inner sphere technology um, and mechs so that they're not even available if you're wanting to play certain time frames. Um, but, yeah, like, just some ideas throwing them out there. Uh, as things are now, um, just looking at the stats, um, the server stats, uh, inner sphere assets. Um, so uh, among tanks, planes, and uh, mechs, there there have been 117,000 inner sphere assets purchased. Uh, I'm not sure when the start date for this data is, but in that same time period, uh, only 88,000 clan assets were purchased. So is that um uh, that's not divided into mechs, tanks, or anything like that, is that? No. Uh you can look it up in all sorts of different ways, I'll send you a link. Sure. Well that's ac- that's actually even a cool uh kind of ratio that you have. So to go back to um your question. Basically, um the concept of asymmetrical teams was always gonna be a non starter. The player count is so low. Um, I think we're down to 14 v 14 max. Um, that you can't really, you don't have the player slots to start messing around and having more players on one team than the other. And in order for that to be justifiable, the gap in power between the two tech bases would have to be so great that when you turn off pure tech, there's almost no reason to ever use any inner sphere stuff. So rather than doing that, what we ended up doing is kind of a threefold way to differentiate the two tech bases. The one that existed at first um, was, of course, the C bill difference. On average, um, client stuff is always going to be more expensive at a tonnage than inner sphere stuff. Then we did it. The, the ticket difference. So ticket on death is probably when you compare it to Battlefield where, you know, the player in the tank or in the jet or in the infantry, when they die, it's one ticket death. Doesn't matter. In fact, if the guys jump out of the tank or the plane and you destroy the vehicle, it doesn't count for any ticket loss. Whereas in this game, ticket loss from asset death is much more important than ticket loss from technically player death. So on average, when you die in a storm crow, you're going to be bleeding way more tickets than if you die in a bushwhacker. I think right now it's 10 or 11 versus 7 or 8. 
So it's built into where you're punished harder. Sure, the clan has a higher ceiling, but if you die in it, you're punished logistically harder for losing more tickets than you would in an IS stuff. So you can do the wave effect to where you can throw more stuff from the inner sphere tech base and not worry about bleeding as many tickets. And then the last one that we actually added after the shutdown, once I took over, um, was the C bill modifier. So the reward modifier. Um, basically, it's kind of a, a hybrid between C bills and tickets. Um, what we did is that whenever you shoot something, um, your re the reward you get for damage and destruction of stuff that you kill is modified based off of where it sit, what you shot, um, where they are in a tier system versus what you were in when you shot it. So I think there's 16 tiers, and your Seville gain gets modified 5% for each difference in tier. So for instance, the Harasser is tier 1, and the Daishi is tier 16. You will get 80% more sea builds shooting at a Daishi with a Harasser, and you will get 80% less shooting the Harasser with the Daishi. And that also helps um, with the asymmetrical balance but that also ended up helping um, snowballs so if someone gets in a big mean mech um, early now um, they make so much less money thanks to the modifiers that it, they're going to struggle to keep that repaired or to buy another if it gets destroyed whereas on the other side the pe all the people still in the lights and the starters are, can just basically beat it like a pinata for money so there's much more of a risk for uptunning that quickly than there used to be. Sounds like you get a lot of yo-yos then between, you know, multiple different aces where you would get, you know, one person in a Daishi, everybody else drive around and harassers until they can pool for another Daishi again and then just switch to another person or, you know, pool. But hey, you know, whatever. I mean, I, I, just, just the thought in terms of just the physicality of it versus, like, I understand in terms of the limited uh, player counts, of course. Um, it doesn't even need to be like one to three, but the, or one to four, but just the physicality of it. Seeing like uh, two clan, like take for example the Mech Warrior Three intro. You have a Mad Cat and a Thor stomp in by themselves into a city, and then you have a whole team of Inner Sphere and even like you know captured clan. Um, even, you know, disabled clan technology being used against them. Uh, just the physicality of that, regardless of the points, I, I just think that that would be more of an interesting um, dynamic uh, approach to that. I was always uh, just, hoping with... Know, uh, food for thought. I was always hoping with mm -hmm. MechWarrior Online that they would have a game mode where you played as a star versus two lances. And you sure. would also have to move away from terrain control as well. Terrain control is by far is the most popular game mode in the game since its introduction. Yeah. Um, which is just a battlefield conquest. When you have less players, you're going to have less map control. And based off how important the map control is for the ticket bleed versus how important deaths are, um, also that's just you're going to run into complications with that because you're just never going to have the boots on the ground to back cap run around the map and get all the right right uh, one one way around that would be either you know limited control points right just have it as like a single one or even two of them or or even like the limited ticket system or you know even change out entirely and go you know pure like deathmatch style i guess you could also change the speed at which each team can cap i guess sure like there's multiple ways it that uh, it was just something that i've always wondered um, rather than restricting uh, uh, very much based in terms of like a one-to-one, -one, uh, I was always wondering like how uh, IS versus clan to have something that feels balanced while you have a symmetrical amount of people on the, on the field. Because of course, you know, you have the very expensive clan technology. It makes sense that they wouldn't have as many physical pilots on the field against the same physical amount of pilots that IS would have. That's actually one of the things that um, 
really dictated what I decided to try and put into the game first as I was trying to fill out the roster for a pure tech. So I believe at first it became IS needed faster heavies and clan needed cheaper lights. So I, that's, those are the areas that I focused on first before moving on to stuff like, you know, the Kodiak, which is just kind of nice to have, but you don't really, quote unquote, need it. And people have played pure tech. Got... Go ahead. People have been playing pure tech a lot lately, and it's, it's been pretty even. It's in an okay spot. It's mostly, most of the problem just comes from some people just really don't like one or one of the styles. So if someone really loves clan stuff and they're stuck on IS, they, it, it kind of miffs them because it's hard to emulate that play style on one tech base from the other. But as far as asymmetrically, they're fairly balanced as it is now. It's just the way that I've done it is more to make the two tech bases, I guess, close the gap between them. Because I clan has better bread and butter weapons, so their ERPPC is straight up better. Their LRMs are straight up better just because they're lighter. The Gauss is straight up better, so on and so on. But the Inner Sphere has I've introduced a bunch of new weapons. So they have a light PPC, they have a heavy PPC. Of course, they have the Rack 5, they have the Rack 2, and they have all these specialist weapons to where in their niche, they can outperform clan weapons. But clan weapons overall are always going to be, you're going, always going to be able to fit more of them, and they're just going to be kind of base better than the basic bread and butter weapons. And that works in a situation where both teams are equal. If I tried to make it asymmetrically balanced for players now, it totally wouldn't work because I think IS would just stomp the hell out of the clans because the tech bases are just closer than they technically should be from lore. Well, that's that's also what I mean in terms of lore that you would have to um, take into account time frame, right? So, of course, you know, Dark Age and further, you have those rotary auto cannons or even, yeah, pre, pre-Dark Age rotary auto cannons. Uh, but in terms of clan invasion, I don't think racks were even involved, for example, but like Goss was. So th- those are possibilities of having those uh, being restricted out. Um, but yeah, like, you know, whatever. Any, There's multiple ways to balance that. And even it, 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 then, in the end, the whole lore thing kind of comes down to the fact that the, Clan pilots were supposed to be way better, and you can't really guarantee that in game. So if both sides are kind of equally skilled, clan again is just going to get rolled. If interfere has a good people who are actually good at the game, right? But you know, LARPing aside, <laughs> yeah. uh, I mean, you already have that uh, advantage based on the equipment that they have, right? Um, so. Arguably, the better equipment, you know, the better, hopefully, the better pilot you are. The, or at least by default, you have the, the potential of being it better. One of the issues with pure tech uh, right now is um, based on how well it works on uh, any given map. Um, some maps uh, handle it just fine. Uh, like, uh, oh, I guess, uh, what's the name? Urban Jungle is now more or less okay uh, pure tech or mixed tech. But then other maps like Ivory Tower, it's definitely in clan's favor. Uh, with Ivory Tower, the main issue is that the forward build bays, uh, sure, they can build um, uh, what, up to 70 ton mechs, uh, but they and they can repair them too, but they can't repair the assault mechs. So not only do you have to walk an assault mech into combat all the way back from main base, but then once it's damaged, if you want to repair it, you have to walk it all the way back to your main base to repair. Yeah, that's another thing that's uh, interesting and in that it's not implicitly stated, but when you actually play the game, it's very obvious that the clans also have superior logistics. So they can get both teams are kind of limited to what they can repair and build forward. But since the clan stuff is always better, 
if the map has really low logistics, and what I mean by that is that, say, only the main bases at the corners of the map can build assault mechs, this is much more punishing to Intersphere than it is to Clan because they can still build their basic heavies forward, and a cauldron born is always going to beat a rifleman. Like a Nova Cat always going to beat a Warhammer. So if you have to bring out an awesome to beat a Nova Cat, you're going to have to bring that awesome all the way out from your main base, whereas the Nova Cat's going to be able to build and repair in the field. And it's kind of turned out where it's kind of neat in that that probably does emulate pretty well the superior, I guess, flexibility the clans would have had. You've also had to fudge a couple of the uh, assets to make sure that they're still buildable, like the uh, Partisan and Warhammer at uh, those forward build bays, right? Yeah, there is no hard rule. I mean, in the, we write on the minimap up to 65 tons, just as a sort of a general rule, but there, it's not exact. So the Novocat and the Warhammer are both forward. They're both 70 tons, but the Thor and the Avatar aren't. But they're still 70 tons. So, and the Partisan, even though it's 80 tons, can build, always build forward, but the Demolisher, being 80 tons, can't always build forward. So, it's, a, it's not in a simple system, but it does work out the way it's built. Did you guys ever um, get working the uh, the Anher, or um, what was the other um, giant? The Karnov. The Karnov, yeah, that's right. Um, did you ever guys get those working with uh, mobile factory uh, setups, or even you know just um, the ability to transport heavy tanks? Because that was something that we always wanted to do. So mobile factory is workable in theory. Um, I thought about it, but decided against it. Um, transporting vehicles was never ever going to work <laughs> because the physics immediately just nope out. Um, <laughs> Cry engine. <laughs> I mean, even in stuff like a, even in a, the, uh, oh, what you call it? The Battlefield games, the latest ones, um, Frostbite, even Frostbite will struggle with that. I know there's supposed to be a big deal where you can tow the weapons and around, and in game it actually is just super buggy. And even so, in this day and age in 2020 with AAA teams trying to do stuff like that is. Uh, okay. Um, uh, it's it's just interesting because like I I do with, uh, via Unreal I do contract work for cranes and I've done nothing but physics simulation with that. Um, so I know kind of how to do that from the ground up. Um, a lot of people say it is impossible, but it's a lot of in terms of like the attachments uh, that you can do with that uh, and have those glued. And I even did a uh, prototype with a crane in Grind and uh, back in the day. I should share that video. Um, and it was, it was the idea behind it was like you know you're you're a wrecking crew that goes around and does like this cleanup for like post po- uh, zombie apocalypse. Uh, it was a little mini game that we pitched uh, for at, uh, for Crytek back when I was working with them, and they loved the idea. And I prototyped it for a little bit, and then um, stuff got canned, and we had to work on Rise, Son of Rome. Fuck that game. Anyway, uh, the point was to use like the rope system. Uh, as the attachments. But yeah, it's more so the physics in multiplayer that causes issues with that. Yeah, it's definitely not impossible, but it's like, you know, stuff, basic physics stuff has been around like since Gary's mods kind of been around yeah, for yeah. years. But, but once you start getting in a multiplayer environment where servers got to keep track of who's where and the play, the tank should technically be able to try and move, and it just it well, becomes a nightmare for they're, sure. Nah, they're not really. Um, arguably, you can what you would do. Well, this is what I would do: is have it so that you would shut down any sort of uh, physical movement, or, uh, other than physicality movement, and have that dictated by the server, and then the server propagate that to all the clients. So it's the server that's dictating what happens to it, right? And you can still, like, because that's even what happens with the, the physical hitboxes is those are updated on server side and then distributed back down to the client. Um, but you still have the client side hitbox that, yeah, determines what got hit and where, uh, and then it communicates that back to the server, and then they just do a check whether or not that's true. Um, 
But in terms of the physicality, if that's done all server side and distributed down, then that's usually fine unless it's trying to do a physics resolve and trying to get out of a, a collision situation. But if you're creating like a hierarchy, then that's all ignored, right? So that should should work. Now, even now, um, we could probably fool at least the mechs into thinking there's seats. So like back in Crisis when you could just get in a seat. Yeah. And we could just have the mech kind of just sit in the back. And I think that would work perfectly fine. Um, tanks, though, would you would have to get some sort of hold down code in there to keep Well, that's, it that's the thing around. about the seats is they're just a glorified attachment system. Uh, and that's that's how I would work it anyway. Um, I know, like, I don't know if you guys still have the source for CryEngine anymore, um, but there is ways to finagle it with the attachment system that you can still do with characters. And since the, well, the, both the mechs and the tanks still kind of rely on that because the tank, in the end, is still a character, you could still do that. Yeah, we still we have the cry mod stuff, but we don't have the actual engine stuff. Oh, that's too bad. But it, it's going to come down. The Karnov and on her is supposed to be the next big patch project I'm going to do over the next few months. Nice. They, basically, I've decided not to do use them as literal transports. Um, I've looked at the models, and they're huge. Um, yeah. <laughs> And the, they were designed that way to hold a, a demolisher in the back. And the actual utility of being able to shuffle around stuff like that is going to be so niche and so limited that I decided eh, what I'm going to do with them instead is basically just turn them into gunships. So if you think of um, the attack helicopter from, oh. the battlefield, from Battlefield, that's the, what the light VTOLs are. The transport helicopters from Battlefield is what the heavy vehicles are going to be. So they're going to have the turret. The only, the only worry that I would have with that is as a gunship, you have so many players situated in one physical location and somebody getting a, a kill on that kills multiple pilots all at the same time. Yeah, I know you have differentiations between uh, uh, the pilot kills versus the mech kills, uh, but the bigger problem would be like the the number of assets that are deployed on the field. You're going to have so many uh, physical players in one singular location. Uh, the the Karnov or the Anher would have to be like physically like very very powerful in order for that to be a viable option, really, in my Cor opinion. Correct. Which is why we decided instead of having players control the side turrets, we're just going to have AI do it um, because there's automated turrets already in the game. Yeah, yeah. We've already We've already experimented that. And some of the, like the new assault tanks have automated flamers. So it works. Oh, that's cool. Um, but it needs a little, it needs some coding work to clean up because the system that's in there is really basic. Um, I don't think it's going to be a problem, but that's pretty much the plan. We're going to have auto turrets on each side. That way you can kind of strafe like a gunship. And then we're going to give the player wep missile weapons on the front so they can shoot themselves as well. And then we're also, once we get around to having the heavier battle armor, they'll be able to spawn in the Karnov and the Anher and just kind of parachute down. So it'll be a hybrid between, you know, a mobile spawn point and a heavy gunship. There you go. One, one thing that, uh, I, I remember having a conversation with Defender about this, actually, um, back when, you know, I guess 0 0.5 era. Um, was with the Karnov and the Anher, uh, even with, you know, the limitation of physical transporting, you know, things back and forth. The idea was, like, even with the... Uh, I, I pitched Defender the idea of, like, why not use the same mechanic that, that the Long Tom has with the deployment and have, like, the Anher and the Karnov, you know, physically, you know, deploy or whatever. And then that becomes a stationary forward base for limited things to spawn out of it. Yeah, we've actually thought about making mobile field bases. Um, in theory, it should be pretty easily doable. It's just one of those things that actually doing it, getting together the artists and having someone guy look at the Lua script, and some guy look at the code, and to get it working, it's just it hasn't been viable at this point. It's something that right. could definitely be doable 
but especially with the game modes we have now, I've just put it off. As far as doing it with the on her, the Karnov, I thought about it. Maybe have a very specific variant, utility variant that can do that, and then have the rest of them just be gunships that you would kind of actively fly around. Yeah, that'd be great. Or at very least, when they land and deploy, um, give them the ability like APCs have and let things buy ammo from them. Yeah, oh yeah. Uh, and APC, you guys still have that as a uh, mobile spawn point for battle armor, right? Yeah. And we also added the Goblin and the Hephaestus can also spawn basic battle armor. Nice. Yeah, because they, they were... Eventually we added that so that you can have actual kind of forward actual spawn points because the APC is not a combat vehicle. So you basically just kind of hide it. It's like a hidden spawn point, but it's actually it's a forward spawn in combat. No. I even saw somebody trying to use an APC uh, in uh, as a combat vehicle just uh, yesterday, I think. Oh, they they were very quickly complaining about how the machine guns didn't seem to do very much. And the next for the next minute, it was just a whole bunch of vets and chat saying, APC isn't a combat vehicle. APC isn't a combat vehicle. <laughs> yeah, I actually moved it to the very bottom of the bar menu and put in the flash a big sign that says, this is not a combat vehicle. Because it used to be the first thing you would see in the buy menu, and so people would constantly take it, drive in, and just do absolutely nothing. Oh, yeah. Because isn't it, yeah, alphanumeric? No, it's actually... The position... It's sorted on the position they occupy in in the Mechlist Lua script. So whatever line they're on, once the table begins, is the order of which oh they yeah, that's right. I think the initial setup of that was uh, uh, just copy paste the alpha the the sorting of it. It was alphanumeric, and it was just copy pasta from that. <laughs> that that actually right. that actually took me forever to figure out because it's not really stated anywhere. Because I searched the code to figure out where the heck it is. I searched the action script and the flash sources. I searched the Lua scripts. I searched the C code. I never actually did find how it decides what order it's going to be in. I just kind of messed around with the Mechlis Lua itself, and eventually I noticed that it changed. And that's probably my biggest complaint of working on this, is that there's a lot of stuff that is very understated on how it works and, or how it's connected, and the flash for the UI is probably the worst of everything. Oh, Yes. <laughs> I know your pain. I mean, we've been um, working on this for like, what, three or four years now, and we've barely changed the flash at all. We still don't have anyone that fully understands. I, I hate action script. Uh, I hate it with a passion. Um, changing anything specifically was such a pain in the ass. Uh, it took us a while to actually fl- find flash artists, and I can't imagine, you know, you guys finding them now, because... Um, oh, yeah. Action Script Three is just so outdated now well, compared to a lot of things. Or yeah, Action Script Two. That's right. <laughs> it's such an outdated concept now. So uh, I don't extent. know. I just hate Flash just in general. It's terrible as far as its performance as well. If you mm-hmm. disable the HUD, you g- gain like 30 frames a second. Oh my God! Really? Yeah, that's horrendous. Wow, that is horrendous. That's one of but the yeah, things like that... there's there's so many things that update per tick in the HUD, and you you have no control over that, which is so dumb. HUD is also one of the things that have kind of held up the including more battle armor because we need to add all the new battle armor and the weapons and everything to the buy menu, and even basic changes to the buy menu. We're only really now starting to get close to being able to change that stuff, and it also doesn't help that. I think Deathshade was the one that worked on a lot of that back in the day. Um, you can tell that all of the sources we have were his personal stuff. He did not label anything. He did not explain anything. So that's just another layer of being extremely difficult to work with. Yeah. Yeah, unfortunately, we were, well, back in one. We were sort of the same, but I guess in terms of... I have an excuse of we were pioneering this stuff and trying to get it out the door. 
<laughs> but you know that. Honestly, I think that's just the curse of the CryEngine because CryEngine, when we were trying to figure that out, um, it it was the exact same. We were in the exact same boat. We had to reverse engineer everything uh, to get any sort of semblance. And you know, like for the longest time, even right before point one, we were still using like the 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 crying or the crisis huds for a lot of things. And still like a lot of the game mode related things, uh, all the HUD elements are still CryEngine, but they're just superimposed with different icons uh, or the crisis menus. Um, I don't know if you guys changed a lot of the buy menu stuff, but that was all early uh, crisis one assets that were just superimposed with different icons. Yeah. The fabled buy menu rework is, has not happened yet. We we brought on someone specifically to try and head bash it himself, but it's something that I looked into. Andrews looked into Star Wraith when he was still here. He looked into, and it's just, it's a, it's a mix of things. It's the fact that the source files in Flash, the actual program is so old. The scripting language it uses is obsolete. Nothing is labeled in the sources, and worst of all, the way it communicates with the C code and CryMod. And then the way that communicates back with the Lua scripts in the regular files, between those three, even the most basic stupid change becomes a great crusade to figure out how the heck it's actually communicating. <sighs> I call that the CryEngine spaghetti. <laughs> uh, yeah, that hadn't, that hadn't changed all the way until, they call it CryEngine 5, but whatever. It it's all the same. It's all the same original crying and and it's all garbage. That's part of the reason why I went to Unreal. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, it's uh, funny uh, you uh, mention uh, crying and spaghetti because I have some spaghetti on the stove and I'm getting hungry and our uh, our recording is getting close to uh, two hours and twenty minutes. So, <laughs> oh, we can call it. I I can keep bullshitting about you know my MWL forever. All right, well, uh, I suppose I'll uh, cut it here. Uh, this has been Returning to Base, a Mech Warrior Living Legends podcast. Thanks for listening, and an extra special thank you to Timothy Seals for our intro music and Shivaxi for our outro music. <laughs>